welcome to Chapter 1, A Brief History of the Development of Healthcare in America. In Chapter 1, we're going to cover key periods in U.S. healthcare. We're going to cover germ theory to the Great War, industrialized care, World War I to World War II, the World War II era, post-World War II to the 1970s, the 1970s to the Affordable Care Act, and then the Affordable Care Act to present day. Overall, germ theory is the theory that certain diseases are caused by the invasion of the body by microorganisms, organisms too small to be seen except through a microscope. The French chemist and microbiologist Louis Pasteur, the English surgeon Joseph Lister, and the German physician Robert Koch are given much of the credit for development and acceptance of the theory. In the mid-19th century, Pasteur showed that fermentation and putrefaction are caused by organisms in the air. And in the 1860s, Lister revolutionized surgical practice by utilizing carbolic acid, phenol, to exclude atmospheric germs and thus prevent putrefaction in compound fractures of bones. And in the 1880s, Koch identified the organisms that caused tuberculosis and cholera. Although the germ theory has long been considered proved, its full implications for medical practice were not immediately apparent. Blood-stained frock coats were considered suitable operating room attire even in the late 1870s and surgeons operated without masks or head coverings as late as the 1890s. So how did we get there? Well, during the 1800s, medical science increased its understanding of the etiology of diseases, etiology meaning causes, and how diseases worked. So perhaps the best example, uh, as you have in your text, is the story of Dr. John Snow, a London physician who in 1854 uncovered the origins of cholera, and in the process became the unofficial father of epidemiology. You see, panic was widespread in mid-19th century London due to a series of seemingly random deaths throughout the capital. So while London was quickly becoming a modern industrialized metropolis, it still lacked the infrastructure needed to support its growing population. The accumulation of garbage in the streets and in the sewers that drained into the Thames River provided a perfect breeding ground for disease. And indeed, that is precisely what happened. Because London did not provide a central water system, people obtained their drinking water from different companies throughout the city. One of the companies on the south side provided water to customers through what residents called the Broad Street Pump. Snow observed that a population of people living in the same area all suffered from this strange and fatal disease at a disproportionate high frequency. He investigated by going door to door to learn where residents obtain their water and concluded that the residents using the Broad Street pump had intercepted a bacterium that caused cholera. Residents were dumping sewage and other materials into the Thames, thus exposing people who used the water downstream from that location. The prevailing theory before Snow's discovery was that the great foggy mist that frequently enveloped the city, which is referred to as miasma, is what caused the disease. Such was the context for medicine at the time. It was an emerging science with relatively few believers. Snow's breakthrough, however, demonstrated that the science of medicine could, prove, could provide answers to questions left unanswered by the chorus of faith-based adherents of the miasma theory. A decade after Snow's discovery, the work of the great French chemist Louis Pasteur, centering on microbes and fermentation, contributed to the growing germ theory of disease. Pasteur's method to eliminate contamination in milk, which was called pasteurization, added to the body of thought about diseases and their origins. While Pasteur is not responsible for germ theory itself, 
His work provided a scientific foundation to disprove the notion of spontaneous generation or the impression that disease somehow spontaneously develops and spreads through the air. In 1867, a few years after Pasteur's findings were published, Joseph Lister, a Scottish surgeon, used the Frenchman's work as the foundation for developing methods to sterilize surgical instruments and patient wounds. As his technique became more widely adopted, it dramatically reduced hospital-based infections. During the Civil War, the Union created the Sanitary Commission to help its army understand the nexus between disease and cure. The commission opened hospitals, encouraged the use of antiseptic techniques, and provided soldiers and veterans other forms of support that were focused on health and hygiene. In the meantime, a number of American medical uh, schools and students grew. As a result, doctors became more available and, and gained a greater degree of respect and acceptance. Licensure requirements erected barriers to the profession, making the proverbial snake oil or charlatan a relic. No, no longer could someone sell their uh, cornucopia of potions and elixirs by simply purporting to lead unsuspecting citizens to healthier conditions. In 1904, the American Medical Association called for minimum standards in education. In 1910, the Flexner Report published a five-year study of medicine in the United States and concluded that medical education should include two years of science and two years of clinical training in hospitals. It further recommended that medical schools affiliate with universities to advance the intellectual underpinnings of the science. This gave rise to expanding access to more qualified and competent care. Health insurance took a significant step forward in 1929 when Baylor University Hospital provided Dallas School District teachers 21 days of hospital coverage for 50 cents per month. The teachers were prepaying for care they might or might not need at some point in the future. This was the birth of Blue Cross plans in which hospitals provided coverage for the insured. At this time, commercial insurance companies maintained their focus on life, property, and casualty insurance and avoided health as a subject for coverage because they feared adverse selection which occurs when healthy people do not purchase coverage. The commercial insurance insurers worried that if only people who were sick bought insurance, the rates would skyrocket because the cost of care would also be quite high. With no or relatively few healthy people in the pool to balance the risk, commercial insurers were reluctant to enter the market. The Baylor plan, however, was strictly not-for-profit and included all teachers, healthy and sick alike. In addition, everyone paid the same premium, 50 cents per month. That this occurred in 1929, the year of the Great Depression, um, it is not a coincidence. As individuals started to avoid health care to save money, hospitals found they had vacant beds and declining revenue. So by enrolling large numbers of teachers, the 50 cents per month per teacher provided Baylor University Hospital with much needed cash and protected the teachers from at least some of the costs associated with a potentially catastrophic illness or injury, thereby spreading the cost over a larger group of people with varying health statuses. As this idea caught on, 25 states enacted laws permitting Blue Cross to operate as a charitable foundation and waived the normally significant financial reserve required of insurance companies. Other organizations across the United States emulated the plan and ultimately sister organizations known as Blue Shield provided similar coverage for physician services. The Blues, as they were called, continued to insure millions of Americans using community rating through late in the 20th century. Community rating 
is the practice of providing health coverage for a group of individuals where everyone pays the same amount for the insurance regardless of age, health, risk, gender, or source of employment. This concept lost some of its appeal as commercial insurers became more active in the market in the post-depression period. Employers, anxious to manage costs, engaged commercial insurers as they began to adjust for risk among various groups. Risk adjustment means that insurance companies adjust the premiums based on the relative risk of illness striking members of the insured group. Thus, for example, insurance for coal miners is likely to cost more because of their exposure to coal dust and pollution-filled air than the insurance for office workers who do not engage in any potentially hazardous activity associated with their employment. So adverse selection, again, is the phenomenon that occurs when there is a disproportionate percentage of patients with greater than average need for medical and hospital care enrolling in an insurance plan. One piece of legislation that forever changed the nature of the contract the American people had with the government was the Social Security Act of 1935. So as the Roosevelt administration prepared this legislation, drafters considered including provisions for national health insurance. And advisors close to Roosevelt, specifically Dr. Harvey Cushing, voiced a opposition to that concept, parroting the American Medical Association so that national health insurance idea never made it even into the draft of the Social Security legislation. The importance of the act, however, rests in its sweeping scope of old age benefits for workers, benefits for victims of industrial accidents, unemployment insurance, aid for dependent children, and aid for the blind and the physically disabled. Implementation of some of these programs came through the states with federal financial support. Some, such as the direct benefits for retired workers, came directly from the federal government. So for the first time, the federal government is providing benefits directly to individual citizens in the form of Social Security payments. The act in its entirety, especially the direct payments to retired workers, established a broad precedent for the federal government government's direct involvement in the lives of individuals, most particularly for the enactment of both Medicare and Medicaid some 30 years later. The Social Security Act provided the bedrock for what would become the pantheon of federal social programs, including health care, that directly affect the lives and well-being of individual citizens. World War II also became a major impetus that forever changed the landscape in financing healthcare services in the United States. Not only did the federal government become more directly involved in providing and financing healthcare, but its wartime policies inexorably set in motion a trend to expand health insurance for Americans. Insurance became an attractive and popular negotiated benefit during World War II. The federal government imposed wage and price controls to avoid, for example, the makers of airplanes from raiding the employees of those companies making armaments. Thus, as wages were frozen, employers searched for alternative mechanisms to recruit and retain their labor force. Health insurance became that recruitment tool. This led to a significant growth in employer-sponsored insurance, or ESI which became the primary mechanism by which individual employees acquired insurance to cover the cost of their care. World War II was also a time when the federal government became more directly involved in providing health insurance. Congress enacted medical coverage for women and children dependent on members of the armed services and expanded coverage for all military personnel. So, as the first half of the 20th century ended, the stage was set for a new era in American society and a new era for health care. The Social Security Act provided direct benefits for the American people. The concept of health insurance was essentially born. War forced employers 
to embrace the concept of health insurance as an additional benefit for employees and the federal government took an active role in providing insurance for a particular class of citizens. Combined, these developments served as the foundation for an era of unprecedented growth in all elements that together form what we call today the American healthcare system. The post-World War II era was a period of profound growth in most aspects of American life, including healthcare. While many think of the 1950s as a relatively tranquil time in American history, often using the phrase peace and prosperity in our time, it was in fact an era of unprecedented growth and the injection of new dynamics into American life. With respect to health services delivery, this growth manifested itself in multiple ways. One of those was the Hill-Burton Act, which was bipartisan legislation aimed at funding the growth of community hospitals in the United States. The legislation's funding distribution formula especially helped rural and poor states where hospitals were rare or non-existent. It also set a goal of creating four and a half beds per 1,000 people. And any hospital that accepted Hill-Burton funding was obligated to provide a quote-unquote reasonable amount of care for indigent patients who could not afford to pay the full cost of care. Because of that provision, the Hill-Burton Act became the first federal legislation aimed at providing health care services for the uninsured. It also was significant in that it relied on the concept of federal and state cost sharing, which is a concept that would be used in subsequent health-related initiatives. So when the funding for the act was terminated in 1975, Hilburton had underwritten the bulk work of modern U.S. healthcare infrastructure. It had provided $3.7 billion in federal funding with $9.1 billion in matched funding from state and local governments. And then during that time, state and local governments added more than 410,000 hospital beds to the system in more than 10,000 projects. So since 1980, Hilburton hospitals and other facilities have provided more than $6 billion in uncompensated care for eligible patients. The post-war era also was a time when the United States invested billions in health-related science, significantly increasing funding to the National Institutes of Health, or NIH. Science was advancing knowledge about human anatomy and physiology at an astounding rate, finding new ways to diagnose new diseases and developing new methods of treatment and prevention. During the same time, the number of medical schools, medical students, and related research also exploded. Much of the NIH funding mentioned previously was allocated to medical schools for advanced research related to disease causation and treatment. And then likewise, the federal government invested in health education facilities. In the 1960s, Congress passed the Health Education Facilities Act that started a stream of funding to open 54 medical schools. And then uh, that was done before federal appropriations ended in 1980. To further address the perceived shortage of doctors, medical doctors, in addition to new st students enrolling in new medical schools, enrollment in existing schools went from an average of 90 per class to 149. So subsequently by 1980, there were 18,200 students in medical school compared to only 8,000 in 1956. In 1954, Congress codified what had been an existing practice, permitting employers to deduct from their tax liability the cost of employees' health insurance premiums. Even though employer-sponsored insurance, or ESI, had expanded dramatically during World War II, the tax treatment of the premiums paid by the employers was uncertain. For the most part, employers relied on a series of private rulings from the IRS permitting them to deduct the cost of premiums for employees' health coverage from their federal income tax. With the passage of the Revenue Act of 1954, however, 
federal law embedded favorable tax treatment for employers providing health insurance for employees. To this day, that deduction remains in place as an incentive for employer-sponsored insurance. In 1964, the political landscape changed. In the wake of the November 1963 assassination of President John Kennedy, his successor, Lyndon Johnson, rode to victory on an enormous wave of popular support. The Democrats, in addition to controlling the presidency, controlled both houses of Congress by large margins. If ever there was an alignment of political constellations to move the healthcare coverage needle another step closer to universal coverage, this was the time. It was in this political climate that President Lyndon Johnson and close con uh, congressional ally Wilbur Mills, who was chairman of the House, and Way House Ways and Means Committee, drove through the passage of Medicare and Medicaid. Like all things political, it was necessary to compromise on a number of prov provisions. Through that, three proposals uh, competed and ultimately resulted in Medicare Part A, which was born from the first compromise. Uh, the second proposal uh, became the foundation for Medicare Part B. And then the third proposal came, uh, became what we now know as Medicaid. So from all of these compromises and negotiations uh, from the passage of uh, Medicare and Medicaid Act, Came Medicare Part A, um, Medicare Part B, and Medicaid. Medicare Part A was coverage for hospital care uh, funded by payroll tax. Part B is for physician care or voluntary outpatient coverage, and that's funded by premium and federal, federal appropriations. And then Medicaid is a federal state partnership of funds for people meeting criteria as indigent. Interestingly, despite policymakers' concerns about dramatic increases in health care costs from the 1970s through the 1990s, they could not seem to control them. Medicare and Medicaid did not address the issue of national health care expenditures, but rather focus on ameliorating the impact of the cost of care on specific population groups, the elderly and the poor and have become major contributors to national health care expenditures. So these two government programs have been among the leading causes of health care cost increases. As costs exploded, presidents in Congress have struggled, mostly without success, to tame medical inflation. President Nixon not only proposed insurance mandates, but also suggested the creation and expansion of health maintenance organizations, HMOs, as a way of managing costs while providing access to primary care. HMOs were a way to limit aggregate spending in the system by restricting access to high cost specialty care. Insurance companies paid providers a set fee in advance to provide care for individuals enrolled in the HMO. And then the HMOs engage the primary care physician as a gatekeeper for the patient. Simply stated, HMO patients could not access specialty care, at least specialty care that would be paid for by their insurance, unless they had a referral from their physician. Likewise, some of the HMOs limited the number of primary care physicians available, so consumers were suddenly limited in their ability to choose their medical care. Consumers began to object, as you can imagine, to these limits, which crescendoed in the late 1990s into widespread and intense consumer backlash that moved the federal and state governments to pass a wide variety of patient protection acts. President Obama signed the Affordable Care Act, or ACA, into law 
On March 10, 2010, after a bitterly partisan political fight, from its introduction, controversy engulfed the ACA that ultimately became intensely partisan. Republicans decried the government takeover of health care, government interference in the doctor-patient relationship, and the creation of death panels intended to control the rising cost of Medicare. There were no death panels, and the administration countered with the argument that the legislation would ensure more people, improve quality of care, and bend the cost curve. Ultimately, legislation designed formally as the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act passed on a straight party line vote in both houses of Congress. Indeed, in the Senate, the Democratic leadership invoked special rules that prevented Republicans from filibustering, further adding to the partisan acrimony. Because unlike Medicare and Medicaid, the ACA lacked bipartisan support, the Republican members of Congress have never fully embraced the law. Between 2010 and 2016, the House of Representatives recorded more than 50 votes to repeal the ACA. Largely, these were symbolic measures with no practical effect beyond demonstrating the lack of political cohesion underlying the act. Meanwhile, as the policy debate raged about the prospect of universal health care or anything remotely resembling universal health care, the health care system itself continued to change in the way it delivered services. Some of these changes were a byproduct of reform efforts, while others were natural extensions of clinical measures already in place. The development of electronic health records, or EHRs, or sometimes you hear them as EMRs, electronic medical record, facilitated the sharing of patient data across multiple providers. The EHR is a digital record of the care provided to a patient by a healthcare organization including the patient's up-to-date, real-time health-related information. When the record can be shared among multiple providers, it is said to have interoperability. It is also, as I mentioned, called an electronic medical record. The clinical coordination is the coordinated delivery of patient care by a team across conditions, providers, settings, and time to achieve high-quality care best effectuated by a common or electronic health record to keep all providers informed. Payment and reimbursement strategies also emerged at the beginning of the 21st century, spurred by new legislative and administrative policy. These initiatives included pay for performance, which is also referred to as P4P, and bundled payments. We'll get into those uh, later on in the course, uh, but right now, uh, in brief, they ask providers to accept more of the risk in financing patient care by incentivizing them to be more efficient and effective in their services. In addition to changes in the way care was delivered and how it was paid for, the structure and governance of healthcare systems also began to change quickly. Mergers and acquisitions continued at a record pace. Healthcare systems became less centralized in a single local hospital and increasingly transformed into large multi-hospital systems that also provided care in a growing number of ambulatory centers. We'll also get into that further on in the course. The next phase in the evolution of the U.S. healthcare system is just beginning. Congress and the executive branch continue to debate and negotiate the repeal of the ACA or amending it to reduce the role of government. Once again, the notion of increasing market competition and reducing government involvement has moved to the top of the political agenda. It will be a significant challenge to repeal popular provisions of the ACA, such as ensuring coverage for those individuals with pre-existing medical conditions, or to eliminate coverage for those Americans who only recently received it. Time will tell whether the intensity of political engagement in the healthcare system is waxing or waning. The forces of greater competition argue that reducing government activity in the healthcare system is the path to true savings, while others maintain that greater free market influence, the greater free market influence will result in higher costs, poor quality of care, and fewer Americans insured. Throughout American history, proponents of greater government engagement and supporters of free market mechanisms have debated their respective philosophies 
with varying degrees of success. Once again, Americans confront that philosophical choice. The outcome of the debate will influence how the U.S. healthcare system delivers care, at what cost, and to whom. The public debate will address questions of equity. How fairly is the care being distributed? That same debate will also address questions of cost. How much is enough? And it will also address effectiveness. How good is the care Americans received? Cost of care, quality of care, and access to care from the form the Iron Triangle. Again, the Iron Triangle is the interlocking relationship among the cost of care, its quality, and access to it.